Okay, uh, hello everyone, um, and glad you're here, still awake. Cloud Native WebAssembly Workshop, heavy topic, and uh, it's for the workshop, so if you have your laptops, then perfect, and uh, we have a GitHub repository, walk through every steps. So today I'm joined by uh, Matt and Sohan, uh, who are from the Fermion team, uh, very deep into the WebAssembly space, um, and my name is Sayam Pathak. I'm a field CTO at Sivo. Um, hope you're enjoying the conference, by the way. Cool. So uh, WebAssembly, uh, so first section, like first 10, 15 minutes, I'll take to set the context for WebAssembly, what it is, why we are so excited, why we are talking about it even. And then we move on to the actual hands-on and see it on the uh, level where you are deploying the application and doing something with it. Um, so usually when the, the big question comes, like what WebAssembly is, people scratch their heads uh, to the four major key areas. Like is it replacement for JavaScript? Uh, is it a new Docker? Is it a, a new programming language? Is it a new Java? What exactly uh, WebAssembly is? So going down the memory lane, um, I'll read the famous um, definition. WebAssembly defines a portable size and load, load time efficient format and execution model specifically designed to serve as a compilation target for the web. So it was given by Luke. Um, it states it very clearly that it's a compilation target, which is exactly what WebAssembly is. It's a new type of bytecode compilation target that you will be able to run um, that specific WebAssembly module or component in any architecture without changing anything, whether it's edge, cloud, any server, wherever it is. Now, it's not something that the attempt, like only WebAssembly made the attempt. Uh, the attempts have been made in the past as well, and you can see, you know, Java applets, you might be aware of that, uh, VB script, Adobe Flash. But how WebAssembly is becoming uh, so hyped up or, you know, uh, making it so reliable that people are thinking that, yes, this is something we have been needing for years, which Java or any of these other tooling failed. One of the major things is that uh, there obviously the jo joint effort made by a lot of organizations. Second is the W3C. That's the very critical one. The It's the fourth uh, language of the web, like after HTML, uh, CSS, JavaScript, you have the WebAssembly over there, which makes it pretty solid under W3C standards. It focuses on the binary instead of the language. So we were talking about Java. So Java was focused on Java, not on any other languages, though it had the same mindset. They wanted to run, uh, you know, write once, run anywhere, the same analogy which was there, but uh, it was not the case. Uh, WebAssembly instead is not focused on a specific language. It is rather focused on the binary format and it gives you the independence or the freedom to write in, the, in your uh, programming language of choice. And it has, the, with a proven track record success, you, you might have heard of uh, Figma or uh, Photoshop. Obviously Photoshop everyone knows. They were able, to, like, it's a heavy software. so. Think of it running in front of you in the browser, loading it, and you are able to do everything with that. Figma, you are creating designs, reimagining your creativity. They both are powered by WebAssembly. They, I like, I treat them as like there are plenty of other use cases. Google Earth is one. Google has been a long time in this WebAssembly space, trying out different, 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 different things with V8 engines and everything uh, that they can. And in the end. Uh, Google Earth, like earth.google.com was previously a marketing page, I think. But after WebAssembly coming to the page, you can actually see how it is. It's actually a 3D, it's a static game, which is there. Um, the static 3D game, I would call it as the, the, uh, the Google Earth. So, so yeah, those are some of the successful uh, use cases. There are plenty more. These are very at a very uh, scale scalable level, like high scale levels. Now, uh, just saying like write once, run anywhere. Uh, you have heard it before in the in the Java days, back in the days. Uh, so how it works is uh, you write your C, C++ Rust application. Uh, you compile that with specified target. Now, not previously, but now in this particular era that we are in and I'm speaking, most of the languages, like uh, Matt, over 20 or how many languages are there? 
20 plus? Yeah, yeah, sort of 25, 25, 26 languages support the compilation to WebAssembly, which is good. Uh, that shows that everybody at the language level have been appreciating the technology. Everybody is moving towards providing a neat compilation target for WebAssembly. So you, it's, it's pretty simple. There, there, there should be one example, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, so you have your web application, uh, you have your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then you'll be able to run the WebAssembly module written in any other language in the browser. So that was uh, WebAssembly, and it's in .dot .wasm format the the uh, binary name F key benefits if you see on the on the screen it's secure sandboxing so you don't like it's deny by default everything is deny by default anything that you need access you have to explicitly define uh, when you are providing the access what do i mean by that it will especially come in the section where i talk about wazi it has near native speeds so speed is something which obviously gained a lot of attraction. So secure sandboxing speeds, polyglot, you can use any application, and the smaller size binaries. Because it is not having the full-blown OS, like the containers and stuff, so it has very small footprint as well. And that is why it is very much beneficial for the edge devices. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about one section on, on Docker where I feel WebAssembly can actually replace Docker, like hot take kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, Edge is one of those areas where I think Wasm would be the go-to choice. Um, you know, it's, it's actually in a lot of POCs in production, but at large scale, it will also happen at the Edge. So again, these are the benefits we saw are there, but again, when a new technology is being developed, it's not only that it serves one particular use case. There are hundreds of brains out there thinking like where else we can use this particular technology. Does it fit to any other domain? Because it has very interesting benefits like isolation, security, multi-platform, instant startup times, where else we can use it. So does the game only is for the browsers or shall we come out of the browser and see what we can do? So, so evolution waves of uh, in, in the container ecosystem or the server world. So we had these servers, pretty heavy variant softwares over there then came in the virtual machines, then came in the containers. And I think WebAssembly very nicely fits in the next iteration over there because it's, uh, it's more sandboxed environment, better than containers. Um, because containers actually, you have to secure them. It's, they are not secure by default. I know you, um, you won't like that statement, but it's, it's true. They're not secure by default. I actually have a Kubernetes workshop tomorrow where I'll talk more about that. Um, and then comes the, the WebAssembly. So Matt has been always advocating as it the fourth uh, you know, uh, pillar in this particular space. Now why you should care, another thing to add on the, on the hype game. Like I'm, I say the hype game, but it's not. Uh, it's not like blockchain. It's, uh, it's actually very different from that. Uh, it, it is usable, so you, so you need to trust. If not me, then uh, let's hear from the one of the experts or the industry leaders or the thought leaders. So if you don't know, Solomon is the founder of Docker, and he tweeted, now this is back in uh, 2019. Now things will get interesting. So this is back in 2019 where he says, if Wasm and Wazi existed in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. That's how important WebAssembly is. Uh, on the server side, and standardized system interface was missing, and let's hope Wazi. So at this particular point of time, Wazi was uh, released, WebAssembly system interface. Because when you talk on the server side, you need access to files, you need access to the file system and do uh, all that stuff. So that's where this tweet came in. In the subsequent tweet, obviously, questions were there, you know, will it replace Docker coming from the Docker founder? So no, but imagine a future. 2019, imagine a future where Docker runs Linux container, Windows containers, and Wasm containers side by side. Over the time, Wasm might become the most popular container runtime, and Docker will love all of them equally. This actually happened last year, November, uh, where Docker announced the preview support for WebAssembly containers. Like, you will be able to package them as OCI artifacts, push them to uh, Docker registry, use the same tool chain. And then we'll talk about the shims as well that makes it run, uh, makes it possible to run on Kubernetes as well. So, so that's how important it was. And you can see the um, predictions made by the thought leaders are actually coming in place. So they, they are falling in place. And that's where um, things are getting more and more interesting. So 
this is how it looks like. A user writes code in Rust. As I told you, you can use your same tool chain, cargo build, target it as wasm32 wasi. It generates a dot wasm file. That's how it looks like. And it should be able to run on any architecture out there. So you just need to have a WebAssembly runtime. Um, you can think of it as you are having a Docker runtime, so you'll be able to run Docker containers. So you are having a WebAssembly runtime, wasm edge, wasm time, uh, and all those. Uh, there are plenty out there. And then you should be able to run your wasm file. So yeah, that's what I was talking about. Uh, when What about system calls when we talk about the server side of WebAssembly? And that's where uh, wasi comes in. So you have your host operating system, and then you have your WASI layer, and then you have your WebAssembly uh, modules running, powered by the runtimes. So it is secure by default, and you explicitly define, you, you put in the holes, like uh, you need access to this, you need access to this. So those access and the interactions happens at the WASI interface. So uh, the WASI will make um, the calls and you know secure so that we don't break the security sandbox isolation because that is critical and that is what Wasm community is very concerned about. So if you if you are in any meeting of Wasm time or Bytecode Alliance, uh, you will understand how much important security is, which actually delays a lot of things uh, happening because they it's it's important to keep the fundamentals of security in place when we talk about WebAssembly irrespective whether we want uh, to go to the route of WASI, how much we want, how much socket connections we want, still that security thinking has to be the first and then only we develop the tool chain around it. So yeah, these are the two things which everyone is excited about, uh, component model and uh, WASI uh, preview two, uh, which comes in with the socket support. Um, and you, you can see, like component model is nothing but think of it as, uh, you have written a library in Python, and I want to use that. So how do I use that? So making that happen, like you, I should be able to use your component, and you should be able to use my component within any language. Like you wrote in uh, you wrote in Python. Uh, let's not talk Java. You wrote in Python, and I, I want to import that in Rust. So I should be able to do that, and that's what component model uh, powers it. So language neutral plugins, uh, reusability. Again, it is uh, being uh, drafted by the Bytecode Alliance. Um, and and I, I don't know, Ma Matt, is it already officially published or what's the status of that? Oh yeah, they are meeting in Seattle for WasmCon. Yeah, at this particular point of time, uh, WasmCon is also happening in Seattle. Uh, so, so that's where the final decisions of component model are made. Now, Wasm versus Docker, a quick uh, overview here. So you have your infrastructure, you have host operating system, you have Docker engine, and then you have your containers. Containers are nothing but your host operating. It's, it's a mini OS kind of thing, or a mini VM that is already having your operating system libraries. When you exec into that, you can see that slash lib and all those folders. Um, and on the other hand, WebAssembly will be having your infra OS, your WebAssembly runtime, Wasi comes with it, and you will be having your Wa Wasm modules that can be run. Again, speed, portability, size, W3C, startup time, system interaction, all these uh, WebAssembly would definitely beat uh, Docker in that case. But that doesn't mean that, you, that it replaces Docker. Um, Docker is meant for a lot of large use cases, big use cases, uh, longer running processes when you have your databases, uh, though there are a few scenarios where uh, WebAssembly is also powering a database is in a different way. But in general, that's how it is. And the place where I feel WebAssembly would kind of uh, replace Docker is on, especially on the edge devices. I know there is K3S. I know, um, I know very well about K3S and some of the smaller distributions that can fit on Raspberry Pis and stuff. But there are even smaller devices than Raspberry Pis with very minimum RAM and stuff. So uh, that's where WebAssembly would make a lot of sense rather than the containers. Now, good thing is, um, with Docker coming into picture and how container D and the container D shims work, it becomes very interesting because now you will be able to use your existing tooling, Kubernetes, Docker, for WebAssembly. Like, you don't have to learn anything new. And then Spin, which obviously uh, Matt will talk about, how from Spin, it makes it easy to create the application, deploy that to anywhere, Spin Cloud or Docker or Kubernetes, and 
using the container D shims. And as of, I think, so when a couple of days back, 0 0.9 uh, came in, wherein you can, two days back, uh, so wherein you can now run in the same pod, Linux container and the WebAssembly module. How cool is that? So I don't have a demo for that. You can maybe bug uh, Sven over there. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's also uh, in place and very soon, um, people will be adopting it and you should be able to run your WebAssembly containers and Linux containers inside the same pod. I mean, it's, it opens up a lot of use cases. So how usually it works is uh, when a Docker container. So you have your Docker container, you say, you know, Docker run or whatever command that you are giving. Then you have Docker D and uh, it creates the container, but it actually doesn't create the container. It goes to container D. It creates the container, but it doesn't create the container. It goes to the shim, and it then goes to the runtime, the low-level runtime, which actually uh, starts the container. And shim is actually acting between the runtime and the container D. So it's abstracting the low-level runtime over here. And then it is creating the task, attaching the container, and uh, waiting for it to uh, completion. So that shim layer is something that the community has worked on. It's officially under the container D project. Uh, it's also under, like TS Labs also has uh, shims, but I think uh, container D is getting more adoption because of the, um, you can see like it's, it's container D, it's under that, so it will get more adoption over there. Uh, so that particular shims, you'll be having Wasmed shim, slide, slim, uh, sorry, uh, spin, and all those shims are there that you can put in your operating systems, and then you will be able to edit the config.toml file and run it. I'll quickly explain how it works like. So you have your, this is the Docker file that you can use, and you can use simple docker build x command using the platform, and then you can tag your image, then push the image. Um, docker also introduced uh, spin support, so if you have just your application by spin, you can copy the spin.toml file, um, and that should directly uh, get uh, build the image from the spin created FASM image. Spin, I'll let Matt talk about more. But where we are as of today, like a lot of companies investing into WebAssembly, uh, cloud providers working on Kubernetes cluster, we have some uh, good announcements later today with respect to WebAssembly. Serverless being the, like uh, WebAssembly is powering the next gen serverless because of the instantaneous startup times. Uh, Matt can touch more on that. Uh, and then more use cases, uh, machine learning, uh, Wasm at edge, massive adoption. So. All in all, it's becoming a great support. Some of the problems, yes, because of the security standard, it's moving a bit slower than, but it's actually moving faster now because of the push from the community that people want to use it in production. Uh, so the bytecode alliance is forced to take decisions faster than they were taking before. Uh, now that's only my opinion. Uh, people can disagree over there. Uh, then logging is uh, another thing. Um, uh, Dilipso is the company, Matt, right? Dilipso. So they recently launched uh, the observability solution with respect to Wasm. So you can see how the things are changing very rapidly. So observability is coming into the WebAssembly modules. Uh, you have your socket support, which is coming with Wasm Preview 2, Wasi Preview 2. Then component model decision getting taken in a couple of uh, days or weeks. Uh, sockets is coming with Wasi Preview 2. Learning curve is being reduced by such workshops and you know uh, all the conferences that are happening. And yeah, Spin also making things easier, which we'll learn now. So yeah, if just just before I end, this is what needs to be done if you want to run it on Kubernetes. So you download that shim that I was telling about, you edit the containerd.toml files, you restart a couple of things, and you should be able to have your node configured to run WebAssembly workloads when you have a specified runtime. Uh, KVASM definitely makes it easier. It's operator, Sven is sitting over there. We have new logo, new stickers in place, so you can ask Sven to give you the stickers for KVASM. Uh, they are freshly out, the first edition, no one has it. No one except from Matt has it. <laughs> so uh, grab those stickers uh, till you have time. And now over to Matt for the workshop that you are waiting for. I hope you got the gist of what WebAssembly is, where we are as of today in Cloud Native, how WebAssembly fits in. And Matt, 
How about you? All right, so uh, workshop time. Let's see if we can build some code very quickly. So uh, there's a GitHub repo here. Uh, you can start typing in the URL if you're ready to get going and while you're typing that in. So the goal is to, the, the, the full goal would be to do a whole magic eight ball kind of thing. So I don't know if you've ever played with a magic eight ball, but uh, you ask it a question and you shake it really hard and then a little answer kind of floats up to the top. Uh, we wanted to kind of do a funny little spin on that where we build an application that does that for us. So if you head over to the workshop here, and again, that's github.com slash fermion slash workshops, plural. So it should look something like this. So we'll just get going coding on this and, and talk a little bit as we go. Um, <clears throat> You can set this up locally. You can run it inside of a Docker container. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to go up to the code tab there and uh, create a new code space. Actually, I created one a couple of minutes ago so that I didn't have to, uh, to get started. Uh, as, uh, because as you click on this, it will take a couple of minutes. I don't ha People familiar with code spaces, this gives you a version of VS Code running in your browser directly backed by the GitHub repo that we're working on. So you don't have to do any Git checkouts. Also, it, it comes preloaded with spin and all of that, uh, so we don't have to install anything. If you do want to install stuff, though, that zero, step zero setup guide will get you started. So it usually takes a couple of minutes to get the, the code spaces environment set up. Once it does, it should look something like this. I'm gonna go ahead and open a terminal window here too. So spin is the command we're gonna use. Spin is a tool for creating serverless functions. Uh, let me bump the size up on that a little bit. Let's do one more. Is that relatively legible? Okay. So spin is a tool for creating serverless functions uh, that will then compile to WebAssembly and then can execute on, uh, well, let's spell version right, uh, can execute in a WebAssembly kind of environment. Um, so I'm making sure, yep, so we should have point, uh, 1.5 preview zero. Okay. I'm gonna go to the readme here and just do it straight off the markdown instead of the browser. So uh, first one will do the setup for us. Uh, next one will help us get started using spin. So uh, I'm running, as you saw, I'm running preview uh, 1.5, the preview release of it. The reason why is because today we announced support for AI inferencing and then we rolled that into the tutorial. So if you look at uh, section two here, uh, we can actually build a version of the Magic 8-Ball that statically encodes the answers, or we can build one that uses um, AI to sort of generate silly 8-Ball answers for us. Uh, but we'll just get started here and kind of see where we go. Uh, so go ahead and open up uh, section, once, you've, once you're uh, done with the setup section, uh, we can go ahead and move on to section one and, and, and then just get going. Uh, so I'm gonna pause here and just as people have questions, you can go ahead and ask or if you need me to help you install something or anything like that, just flag me down. So once you've got spin installed, you should be able to use a variety of different languages. I'm gonna do mine here in TypeScript. So spin new is the command to create a new application. I'm gonna do an HTTP TypeScript version, so that's HTTP TS, and uh, then you give it a name. So I'm gonna give mine, I'm gonna just call it 8-Ball. 
and that's going to, I'm gonna leave the description blank, accept all the defaults, and there I should have a directory called 8ball, and if I look inside there, it has the usual TypeScripty kinds of things, so let me navigate to that here, because I just created it right inside this workshop, and there's my index file there. I'm gonna edit this up a little bit. Since I'm using TypeScript, I'm gonna do an NPM install inside of here. And I'll let that run in the background. So in, in TypeScript land, this is about the smallest spin program you can do. So all I'm doing here is uh, it auto-generated a request handler for me. So when, when spin gets a request, it'll launch this function and do whatever the function says. All I'm doing is returning a very simple object that sets the, the HTTP status to 200 and then says, hello world. So I'm, I'm off script already. I, I don't think the 01 already uh, has you do hello world, but I'm gonna spin build that. So we did a spin new, created a little program here. Now we do a spin build that builds it into WebAssembly. And then the last part, if you wanna run your application, you've got two choices. You can spin up and run it locally, or you can spin deploy and run it inside of Fermion Cloud, basically just a uh, our hosted version, it's free and e very easy to use, so it's gonna prompt me here. So I did a spin deploy. It's gonna prompt me to go authenticate to the cloud, which basically uh, is going to use my GitHub credentials to authenticate this particular session of code spaces to my Fermion Cloud account, and that's all there was to that. So uh, now it's gonna finish deploying, and at the end of this, I will get a publicly accessible a domain name, so you'll be able to. Okay, so while that's running then, so I did three things so far. I just did spin new to create the new project, chose my language, named it. Then I did a spin build to build the WebAssembly binary, and then I did a spin deploy to push it up somewhere where I can see it. And so at this point now, uh, I have an endpoint, and it says hello world, because that's all I had it do there. So is anybody installing locally? Okay. So while people are continuing to work through, I'll just uh, explain a little bit here and there. Feel free to tune me out and keep working on the workshop if you want or whatever. Um, but so there's, of course, our source code directory is where our source code goes. Most of these others, if you've worked on TypeScript before, you're familiar with all these. If you did the Rust tool chain instead of the TypeScript tool chain, you'll see all the regular Rust stuff in here. Same with Python, same with Go. You're gonna see your regular tools, but there is one file that is, might be unfamiliar to you, and that's the, uh, the spin.toml file. This is the file that has the configuration directives for spin. And it has a little, little bit of front matter up here, just kind of tells us some basic stuff about spin. And then each time we write a serverless function inside of a project, 
we're going to add a component there. Uh, so this one ju was just the one that was scaffolded out by default. Later on, we, we will add a couple. If you're following along in the tutorial, you'll add a couple of items in, into this file. So index.ts and spin.toml are the two main files I'm going to be working on here. So the architecture of the app we'll build will have kind of a, a, a JSON API and then sort of like the front end code. And we'll start with the JSON API. Uh, so that's in step two, the JSON API, and then kind of work your way into the, into the back end code from there. Uh, again, probably if you clone the repo, a lot of the assets and things like, there are, things like that are already in the repo and it makes it a lot faster to do some of the later steps in the tutorial. Uh, So I just made a change to my content type. I'm going to spin build and spin deploy again. And that's kind of how you do this upgrade cycle. If you're using local, you can do a spin build dash dash up and it'll start a, start a listener on local host. The dash dash up will start a local one.
Okay, so I'm still kind of playing my way through part two. I'm gonna try and do this with LLM. This is unrehearsed, so let's see what happens. I'm going to use Llama 2 chat for my model. Okay, so here's what I'm trying to do here. We'll see if this works. Uh, so I'm trying to use the Llama 2 uh, LLM model to answer the question, as a magic eight ball, give me a one or two word answer. I have very low confidence that that particular prompt will actually result in something useful, but let's give it a shot and see what happens. And then all I'm doing is uh, treating the result as JSON data and grabbing the text that Llama 2 ret returns there. So if I were running the LLM inferencing locally, even a query, even a prompt only this short might take 10 or 15 minutes to process on a 13 billion parameter model. So I'm going to run it in Fermion Cloud, which is using SIBO GPUs, so it'll be much faster. Much faster. Oh yes, spin.toml is important. So I'm editing the spin.toml now because I do not have permission by default to use an AI model, so I have to ask the runtime for permission to run it. So I'm telling it I need the AI model's Llama 2 chat, and I hope that's the right format there.
that that's the right one. Yep. In, uh, on your uh, example, on your block, it's on the trigger, not on the controller. <laughs> I put it in the wrong place. That would make sense. Let's give that a shot. Let's see. Just realized the dev container I started is old. So I'll be waiting for that to restart. <laughs> so what happens when you release a new feature at 10 o'clock for a workshop at 11? <laughs>
So we did, yeah, we did the, the LLM we released this morning. Um, and uh, it is possible that if you're using it, you may still have to request access for it. So if you don't, if you're trying that version and you want access, let me know, and I will see if I can get you added for that. Um, Are we uh, 55? Is that one? In? Okay. All right, so there we go. We actually got the LLM model to give us a couple of magic eight ball answers that are really not very good yet. What's the best way to learn about the world? Uh, apparently answer and question are too vague here. My prompt engineering skills are not that good. A magic eight ball, shake it and ask it a question and it'll respond, do you think that humans will ever travel to other planets? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of wrap us up here because we got about three minutes left. So I've just been kind of playing around with, uh, with step two of this. But if you want to keep going, uh, so we did the setup step in one and you can install spin locally. You can build applications very much in this kind of style of just a minimal serverless style application and you can build it in the language of your choice. I did TypeScript here. Uh, from here though, if you're to continue walking through, right, um, 
we, we were working on the JSON API. We tried to, I, I was playing around with a, uh, an LLM version of that. You can statically encode it. You can do a random one, whatever, whatever sort of uh, is, your, is your preference there. But then if we were to walk on and continue through this tutorial, we'd start adding a front end here in step three. Uh, all the files and assets are all there for you, so it's really a matter of copying some uh, HTML and some assets into the right directories and then serving it with a static file server, which is built into the sprint, uh, spin environment. And then kind of moving on from there, uh, key value storage, very simple kind of storage um, where you store a string and a value, uh, and the string key and some kind of value. Uh, and so in this part of the tutorial, you can kind of move on and store your answers there. You can uh, store the questions there and then pull one randomly out of key value storage. Uh, we already did step five. That was deploying to Fermion Cloud. And then uh, external databases. Uh, Spin comes with a built-in SQL database as well. And so you can use that to create applications. And in this section, uh, you can try out doing that. And then Fermion AI is the other one we were just testing out just now. Uh, so here's a Rust version of the code that's very similar to what I just wrote in TypeScript. And then step eight, if you get, if that's the kind of thing you want to do too, um, this will get you all the way to deploying it on Kubernetes. So from there, if you want to kind of walk through this tutorial on your own, feel free. Um, later on this afternoon, I'm going to go in, I'll, I'll do a presentation that kind of goes into depth about how we do AI, what uh, what the inferencing model is like, how we use Sivo to run our inferencing, and so on. So that'll be after Siam's presentation, which is at 2.45, and that's the big session where Sivo is going to announce a lot of the new features. Tomorrow, Sven is doing, you want to raise your hand, Sven? Sven is doing one on Kubernetes and how to install WebAssembly into Kubernetes. Uh, David Flanagan did his already today. Who else is? Uh, Ashwin is giving a talk later on this afternoon also about WebAssembly and kind of the maturity of WebAssembly. So there's several good talks on this sort of family of WebAssembly related talks that you can go to if you want to kind of learn a little bit more. Uh, with that, we are right at time right now. So thank you very much for coming in and uh, playing around with WebAssembly and spin and AI and stuff with us. Mm -hmm.